Good evening, everyone who already joined. We are going to start our event very soon, but uh, in the beginning, we're just waiting for everyone to join in uh, the Zoom session or, yeah, before our YouTube starts as well. So. Exactly eight in my clock, so I will wait for one more minute for uh, whoever wants to join in by then, and then probably I'll just start with the introduction and when people will be joining in, we can just go through the first part of the session. All right, so I will just, I think, start going through the introduction part while people are still joining in. And uh, so, yeah, good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to our uh, today's uh, Astronomy on Tap session of Astronomy on Tap Leiden, the July session. So we were uh, taking a pause last month. So thank you all for joining after uh, this uh, little pause and joining us on Zoom. Uh, today we have, as usual, uh, two very exciting talks. And today we have two talks about radio skies and supermassive black holes and uh, where to find them. So before we go into the um, today's talks, we uh, just for those who are joining uh, newly or just uh, those who need a little reminder, Astronomy on Tab is a monthly event uh, on uh, talks on different topics of astronomy. And um, it started in New York in 2013. And currently there are more than 40 locations all over the world. Astronomy on Tab Leiden uh, though started in 2017 and it's the first uh, Astronomy on Tab uh, that started in Europe. So, um, we usually have events on the last Monday of every month from 8 to 10. We do it uh, live at the Grand Café de Burgs at Leiden, but of course, because of all the restrictions now, we're doing it online for actually uh, over a year. So thank you all for being with us online uh, through all of this. And um, yeah, so because we are all joined together online anyway, so probably all of you already know about our social media channels, but if you didn't connect to any of those and would like to, please join us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram. And also if you don't like social media, but would like to get updates, you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter at the, at the bottom in our email and we'll just send you a monthly events a reminder once per month. Mm, yeah, so today on 26th of July, we're streaming live. So we are uh, streaming here on YouTube, and but also we're streaming live, uh, sorry, on, on Zoom as well. So please give us a shout out in the Zoom chat if you're joined with us here or uh, on YouTube chat and let us know where you're watching it from. I'd really love to hear about that. And um, as usual, after each of our talks, the speakers will be taking questions. So you can leave your questions for the speakers in the Zoom chat. Uh, also, if you're watching on YouTube, we can leave the questions on YouTube chat as well. Um, but also, if you're connected with us on Zoom, you can raise your hand virtually after the talk to raise the question yourself. Uh, but in that case, uh, just uh, please bear in mind that then you will be also live on YouTube when you ask the question. So just uh, if you're not comfortable about that, you can, you can just uh, leave the question in the, in the chat and then uh, one of us will read it out to the speakers. Uh, finally, before, before the talk, we have some very exciting astronomy news in this month. So first of all, uh, there has been this um, really since 2019 and 2020, there was this mystery of the great dimming of the star uh, called Betelgeuse. So some of you may already know about the star and also about this, uh, this situation. So Betelgeuse is, the, um, is a, a bright orange star in the constellation of Orion. And since 2019 and 2020 uh, and early 2020, there was a clear uh, fluctuation in its brightness. In this uh, image from it, so you can see that the brightness of the star surface is clearly very different. So it was a great puzzle, uh, like why was it happening? Um, however, a very recently published paper uh, apparently solved the mystery. So it's uh, basically um, the star was uh, concealed by a, by a dust cloud of dust. And this dust is uh, uh, formed because of uh, 
a bursting of gas that uh, started from the star itself. And when uh, the gas was around and ejected outside from the star, the star's uh, temperature, surface t- temperature went down in some places and the temperature difference was high enough that the gas actually cooled down to uh, and formed dust and it came in front of the star. And that's why there was this shadow and it became, uh, and therefore uh, the, the puzzle is finally resolved. So great. And another, uh, great uh, update is that there's the first uh, imaging and of um, uh, circumplanetary disk. So what does it mean is that uh, here in the left, you can see that there is in the center, there's the star and surrounding the star, there is this bright ring, which is the circumstellar ring. And this is a uh, uh, pre uh, planet formation space. This is where planets are forming, we know, but uh, here in the zoom in session, you can see that there is this uh, mini planet and around it, there is this, uh, this circumplanetary disk and uh, the speculation is that this is where the moons are forming around the planet. So with this uh, direct imaging and unambiguous uh, detection of this circumplanetary disk, now the, the science of planet formation and moon formation can really went to a giant leap and we can now test many more theories uh, in this regard. So that's uh, super exciting. And on top of that, there is another very good news that the Hubble Space Telescope is uh, back to taking pictures uh, for science uh, purpose again. So uh, a little over a month ago, following a computer anomaly, the telescope was suspended for this uh, this work, but and it was um, feared that maybe it was the end of uh, this, uh, this great telescope to give us science images. But thankfully uh, for all of us, it is back. And this is one of the first images that it took after being back in action. So uh yay to that <laughs> yeah and um whew, after all of that now we come to our tonight's program so tonight firstly we have a talk from uh, wendy williams and it's going to be about supermassive black holes and where to find them afterwards we'll have our usual quiz um and uh, there will be uh, prizes for winners as usual and then we'll have our second talk about radio skies through prying eyes by fritz Feyen. so Finally, on to our first speaker today. Uh, it's uh, our Astronomy on Tap Leiden's very own Wendy Williams, uh, originally from South Africa. She's uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher at Leiden Observatory, and she did her PhD here as well. So during her PhD, uh, since her PhD actually up until now, she has been uh, producing um, images of the sky in low radio frequencies, and then she's using these images to study uh, supermassive black holes and their host galaxies. And today in her talk, she's going to tell us more about how she does that in her uh, in her work. And um, when she is not doing science, she loves uh, rumbling around uh, in um, in countryside and she loves uh, long distance walking. But apparently one of the craziest things she did in this regard is a uh, all night charity marathon through London. And in the, in the picture here, you can see her uh, just after sunrise uh, when still there was two miles left in this walk. So with that, I leave the floor to Wendy. Uh, enjoy the talk. All right, thanks, Lovin. I'm just going to share my screen. Great, uh, so you can see me and hear me and see my screen, hopefully now. Let's check that, yep. Okay, so many of you probably have seen this uh, this image of the the shadow of the black hole um, around the well, the black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. Um, this is kind of old news now. Um, it's taken t- uh, in 2019, uh, already two years ago. Um, scary how quickly time has gone on. But this is a really incredible image uh, that was made the first sort of direct image of. Uh, the shadow of the the black hole and you can see the the accretion disk of uh, highly ionized um, plasma that's being sucked into the the black hole Um, and the reason why this this image is incredible is that this is a source that is about 200 times the the distance from the the sun to the earth Um, and it's many millions of kilometers away Uh, and yet we're able to with radio telescopes actually image this the detail of the source Um, But what I really want to do is take this image uh, and then zoom out. Uh, And if you zoom out um, a factor of 100 times, uh, now you have to use a different 
a kind of telescope. It's still a radio telescope. It's called the Very Long Baseline Array. Uh, so this is a factor of 100 times bigger than the central black hole. Um, and what you see is something completely different. You see these weird kind of jets shooting out the, the black hole. Um, so what are these? Um, and it's something that we still don't fully understand how they are produced. Um, but essentially, you have magnetic fields all tied up in the material that's orbiting this, this accretion, accretion disk and falling into the black hole and getting all tangled up. Um, and there's something that we do, well, scientists do, particle physicists do here on Earth, is build giant particle accelerators using magnets. Um, so through this process of uh, extremely strong magnetic fields, you have a whole lot of ionized uh, particles, electrons, protons, and so on. Uh, in this very hot material around the black hole. Um, and those magnetic fields manage to accelerate um, the, the particles, the charged particles, and send them shooting out away from the black hole um, to very large scales, which we will see. And as we zoom out even further, so now going a factor of 10,000 times further away, uh, so this source here is 10,000 times bigger uh, than this source, um, and you can see these, these jets really shoot out to, to great distances compared to that, that black hole that lies right in the center of this galaxy. Um, and then just going out, one more factor of 10, uh, we get all the way from the black hole at the center to these huge jets. And these jets are taken imaged with a, a telescope LOFAR, which I'm actually going to talk a bit more about in this talk. Um, so this is a factor of 10 million in scale between the tiny black hole, which is very massive at the center of the galaxy, uh, and these huge jets, which really extend beyond the size of, of the galaxy itself. So if you were to look in the optical, this is what you would see, a somewhat boring, um, very massive uh, elliptical galaxy. It's full of old stars. Um, and this black hole lives right at the center. Uh, even in the optical, you can see a bit of a jet here. Um, but then this black hole shoots out these, these jets of charged particles, um, which actually I'll explain in a moment, uh, shines very brightly in the radio. Um, so to answer my initial question, uh, where do we find supermassive black holes? Well, we find them all over. We find them in almost every galaxy. And in almost every very massive galaxy, um, they produce these radio jets. So to find these black holes, all we have to do is make images of the sky uh, in the radio. Um, so after that brief introduction, uh, I'm Wendy Williams. I'm a postdoc here at uh, Leiden Observatory. Uh, and usually I'm behind the scenes or doing the introduction to these Astronomy on Tap talks. So tonight I'm very excited to be able to be um, speaking to you uh, about, my actual, about my actual science. So to start off, um, if you were to go out uh, in a nice dark place on a dark night, um, maybe somewhere where there's a radio telescope like this one here, this is a very large array, uh, and you'd look up and you'd see this amazing sky of, uh, full of stars, uh, even the stars of our Milky Way galaxy uh, falling along a line in the sky because we're inside it. If your eyes were as big as these radio dishes and you could actually see the long wavelength radio light, you would see maybe a similar picture. Uh, you wouldn't see the horizon here, um, but you would see a sky full of stars. Um, actually, they're not stars. Uh, we'll see in a moment that these are entirely different galaxies very, very far away outside of our own galaxy. Whereas all the stars we see in the optical, almost all of them lie in our galaxy. So this is an actual image made with a, a relatively new telescope. It's called the Murchison Widefield Array in um, Australia, and it's already made uh, some images of the whole southern sky. Uh, and this is an actual image made with that data. And here you can see the spectacular image of the, the Milky Way across here. Uh, this really, really bright source down here with these jets that should look familiar from our first image. Uh, this is a, a black hole right here, shining, uh, producing these jets. So before I talk about what exactly all these sources in the, the radio sky are, I just want to highlight a brief difference in the actual physics that produces the radiation that we see. 
Uh, so almost everything that we're used to looking around and seeing with our eyes um, is light that is emitted essentially because everything has some energy, it has a temperature, uh, and it gives off radiation as it loses energy. Uh, and this is something that we're, we're quite familiar with. Um, it's also very well known that it has a, a very um, clear structure with regard to the, the frequency coverage. So this is the, the intensity or the brightness of the light as a function of frequency or, or wavelength or, or energy of the, uh, the light that is emitted. So the colder something is, the, the more red it will be. And the hotter something is, the more blue it will be. Same way you put a poker in a fire and it goes first red and then becomes white hot or bluer. But the, the emission we see in the radio, if you go to radio wavelengths, which is all the way down here, um, this will be very, 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 very faint and you would need an extremely sensitive telescope to be able to see this. But actually, uh, there are different kinds of processes. And I might have given you some clues already early on in the talk. Uh, I said a lot about magnetic fields. Uh, I said a lot about charged particles that are accelerated uh, to very high velocities, very close to the speed of light. Uh, and whenever you have charged particles interacting with magnetic fields, uh, they give off radiation that is called synchrotron radiation. And it's similar to the thermal radiation that we just saw. It has a peak, uh, and the lower the energy of the the particles that are moving or the slower they're moving, uh, the peak actually goes to, to longer wavelengths. But it turns out that there's actually millions and billions of, uh, of different particles. Uh, and there are many more lower energy ones than there are high energy ones. So this emission all stacks together. And what happens is you have things, the fact that things get brighter as you go to longer wavelengths. So the lower frequencies you go in the radio, uh, the brighter these sources are and the easier they are to detect. Uh, it gets more complicated than this, but this is the essential um, sort of mechanisms, mechanisms behind the, the emission we'll see. So just coming back to this, this radio sky, we can look in some more detail at some of the sources we've seen. We've seen these, these double lobed structure things, but there's also these kind of round sources, which if you zoom in, and also take images of them at other wavelengths, like the, the optical, infrared, and x-ray. You see a similar structure. They light up with different colors corresponding to different elements. Um, and what's happening here is when a star explodes or goes supernova, uh, it produces puffs of clouds, uh, which get shocked, which produce uh, electrons, um, which interact with the magnetic field, so they shine very brightly in the radio. Um, but of course, galaxies are full of stars, full of stars that are busy forming and then dying quite quickly. The mass of stars die in a few million years. Um, so they're constantly producing, if they're forming stars, they're constantly producing this kind of supernova remnants and also constantly producing these electrons which propagate through the, the, the rest of the galaxy. So here's a really nice image. In the radio, you can see these spiral structures of a very well-known face-on spiral galaxy. Uh, so you can see the star formation actually happening in galaxies. You don't see the stars themselves because the stars are shining with thermal radiation, which are too faint for us to actually see. So the final kind of sources, uh, the largest category, there are some other more exotic things we see, um, but the final main thing we see in our survey images are these, these jets from black holes which I've already talked about. And you can see that these come in a huge variety of, uh, of flavors and structures. These ones are actually all plotted on the screen about the same size, but they, they vary massively in the, the size, sometimes not even bigger than the galaxy they live in, and sometimes they're, they're huge, uh, stretching to millions of light years across. But what I've showed you now is that with the radio and by making images of the full sky, we can see all these star forming galaxies and we can see these black holes. Um, but what I haven't said is why it's, it's actually really interesting to study both of these processes together. So when we look back over the age of the universe, so this is two plots that show uh, time running backwards to the start of the universe on the right to the present day on the left. And the one shows 
the, the rate of black hole activity. So sort of how many of these actual radio jets we actually see um, or uh, presence of black hole emission in, in other wavelengths we also see. And on the other plot, it shows the, the amount of stars that are actually forming in galaxies over time. And we can see the two follow each other very well uh, at about half of the age of the universe that's around here. Um, the universe was really very busy forming galaxies um, and also producing a lot of jets and a lot of activity from black holes that were very busy feeding. So as the stars grew, as the galaxies grew, the black holes grew at the same time. Uh, and we can also see this in actual data if you uh, look at the, the mass of the galaxies. Essentially, the, the bigger the galaxy is, uh, and we find the black holes in the center, we find that the bigger galaxies have bigger black holes. So as they form stars, they form bigger black holes at the same time. So the two processes are very interconnect interconnected, and we don't fully understand exactly how. Um, but one of the, the really useful things about the radio in particular um, is we can see these radio jets. And these radio jets actually have an important role um, in how stars can form in the galaxy. I think that seems strange. The black hole is this tiny but very, very massive thing, but still compared to the, the galaxy itself, it's quite tiny right in the center. How can it influence um, how stars are formed? But the, the thing is to go back and think about how those stars are actually formed. So those stars are formed from this huge um, sort of vat of, of gas um, that's sort of lying in between, uh, in between galaxies in this intracluster medium. And this gas we can see if we look at, well, with X-ray telescopes. So we can see this kind of gas shining. If we look in the radio, we often see these radio jets here. Uh, and if you look in the optical, you just see a, a boring old galaxy. Um, but what needs to happen for this galaxy to form new stars is this gas needs to cool down and essentially rain onto the galaxy. And it's that gas that will, under the influence of gravity, compact and, and form new stars. But as that's happening, it's also feeding the black hole in the center. And when the black hole is feeding, it's what produces these, these jets. And these jets can blow these huge bubbles, as I've said, to, to scales much larger than the galaxy itself. And it actually blows bubbles into, into the gas around it. Um, and it creates shock waves uh, and it heats the gas uh, and it essentially shuts off star formation uh, in the galaxy. But it also shuts off the growth of the, um, the black hole as well. So the two processes happen together in a, in a feedback way. So just to show you a little bit of how, um, what is actually happening here, just need to turn this off. Um, in this animation, you can see in the blue is this, this kind of hot X-ray gas. Uh, and when it gets brighter or lighter colored blue, it's actually being shocked and its temperature is increasing. And in the yellow, you can see these, these jets being blown out. Uh, and you can see how it produces these shock waves, the same kind of shock waves that you have um, in the front of a ship that's moving through the water or in front of a, um, a jet that's going faster than the speed of sound produces a, a shock wave. Um, so we have lots of um, simulations. These simulations are very complex. They involve uh, magnetohydrodynamics, sorry, relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. Um, to really understand how, how this happens. Um, but we can complement this with, with observations. So we need to go out and find these, um, these black hole jets and also find the, the star forming galaxies. Uh, and this is where I want to introduce LOFAR or the low frequency array. Uh, this is a telescope that I've been working on for a number of years, making the images from. Uh, and it's found here in the Netherlands uh, in a rather populated place full of uh, interference from, from people, um, but we're able to still make images of the sky with this, this instrument. It's an instrument that operates essentially at around 100 to 200 megahertz, and that might, those numbers might mean nothing to you, um, but it's similar to kind of the, the frequencies that FM radio operates. Uh, and you need some quite large antennas to collect this uh, long wavelength light. Uh, so you can see this 
uh, image here is me with one of the, the lower frequency antennas. So what we do, and I, it, it's taken many years to do this actually, um, but I'm not going to go into the details, but what we do is we use this telescope to make images of the sky, like the very first uh, two images I showed uh, of the full sky. So this is just a single image with this telescope. Um, and what you can see is it's full of all these, these specks of light. Um, but LOFI is a really powerful telescope because we can observe um, quite wide areas of the sky. Uh, so it takes, it doesn't take very, very long to cover the full sky. Um, but we can also see very fine details. Um, and actually what Fritz is going to talk to you about after this um, is how we can see even finer details uh, with the aspect of LOFA that's international. Um, but even with the, just the Dutch LOFA, we see all these uh, myriad of structures of mostly double-lobed uh, black hole jets. Uh, so what we're doing with LOFA uh, is we're going to cover the whole northern sky that we can see uh, from the Netherlands. Um, and this is just depicting our progress so far. It takes 3,000 3, individual images of the sky to cover that full area. Um, and we've already covered over 50% of it here. You can see in green and in blue. Um, but just in, in the final moment here, I want to mention that the, the radio is wonderful. It reveals um, these jets coming from the black holes. But we've actually got a bit of a challenge um, this survey will reveal millions uh, of new sources, uh, and these sources have very complicated structures. So there's a part of this that uh, we're still figuring out how to do it uh, with processes like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, but right now, humans are very, very powerful at being able to look at a radio image, here are these jets, and an optical image, and be able to say that this is the optical galaxy in which the black hole lies producing these jets. Uh, this is quite a trivial case here. Um, some of them are much more complicated. Um, and actually, we're running a, a citizen science project. If you've ever heard of Radio Galaxy Zoo, um, or even just Galaxy Zoo, uh, and the many offshoots in not even just astronomy uh, that they've done. Uh, so this is a project where we're looking for volunteers. We actually have a number of volunteers already busy doing this. Uh, to look at images like these um, and put together the, the puzzle pieces of which uh, sources, radio sources, actually belong together um, and which ones don't. So if you're interested, I'd say uh, take a look at lovegalaxyzoo.nl um, and get involved and contribute to, to real science. Once we've found these supermassive galaxy, the black holes, uh, we really need to understand more about them, like uh, where they are in the universe um, and exactly what's happening in the, the galaxies that they live in. So I will end there uh, and say thank you very much and take any questions. Thank you so much, Wendy, for this fantastic talk. I'm always so amazed at the scale of these jets, uh, especially when you put it in context uh, with you know, the um, Event Horizon image that uh, came out. It's really Fantastic. Yeah, factor of 10 million between the two is incredible. Exactly. Uh, I would like to invite our audience to um, ask their questions. So you have um, different options. So you could put your question in the chat, either in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube chat. Um, or you can use the raise hand button uh, to um, raise your hand and you could then unmute your mic and ask your question yourself uh, from Wendy. So while we wait for, um, for questions to come in, uh, I would like to begin with a question, Wendy, um, since there's this really large uh, sort of survey that you're doing with LOFAR, are there other uh, surveys just as large that you could then use sort of data from these ancillary um, wavelengths, let's say, um, to understand the nature of these objects? Uh, yeah, certainly. So I, one thing I didn't mention too much is it's actually useful to have information at multiple radio wavelengths. Um, but at this point in time, LOFA is really the best um, radio telescope to, to do these surveys. Um, but it's not just the radio, it's the, the optical and the, the sort of thing I alluded to at the end there about finding the, the host galaxies is actually really important. Uh, and we need 
the the optical data or infrared um, that goes very very deep um, but it's a good thing a lot of people are interested in studying galaxies as well so there are a number of large uh, very wide area covering if not the whole sky there are some surveys that cover the whole sky uh, and then some that go much deeper in, in specific areas uh, and sometimes they include spectra as well so you get the redshift to the distances to the sources and you get other information like the, the mass and how many stars they're forming. Nice. Um, I see no questions, so I will ask you one more question myself. Uh, I'm wondering also with the square kilometer array uh, that will be coming live, let's say in the next 10 years or so, how does the wavelength coverage compare? Um, how is the sensitivity? How do they compare to LOFAR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the square kilometer array is a bit of a, an interesting project because it's similar to LOFAR is actually two telescopes in one, because it could be in two different places. Um, so it has a high frequency component, which is quite different to, to LOFAR because it covers a different frequency. Um, but it does also have a, a low frequency component. Um, I forget the exact details. I don't think it goes down as low as uh, LOFAR does. So LOFAR has this component that goes all the way down to uh, 20 megahertz, essentially. Uh, and I think the SKA will only go down to 200 or so, so the kind of upper end of our our band. Um, but the other thing is the SKA is, it's, a, it's an observatory designed to do many different things, but the, the low component is really designed to, to look at things like uh, pulsars uh, and the very, very early universe. So it's, um, it's built a little bit differently. So we will always still have apart from seeing the northern sky, which the SKA in the south won't, um, we will always have a very high um, resolution compared to what the SKA will have, even just the, the Dutch LOFAR. And then Fritz is going to talk in a moment about the, the very, very high resolution aspect of LOFAR, which is going to remain competitive uh, even in the SKA era. Great. Um, and from the southern sky, is it easier then to see the galactic center and study maybe Yes, yeah, it does have that that benefit. Um, the the uh, also for for the black hole picture I showed right in the beginning, seeing the black hole in our own galaxy uh, really needs the southern hemisphere. Exactly. So when you go to LOFAR, do, is it completely radio quiet? Like you have to turn your phone off, or there's no radio, no nothing. Or how's that? No, I don't think so. I think I visited the the LOFAR call with my my phone on. Um, yeah uh so it's built right in the middle of europe um where humans are everywhere and there's there's even digital audio broadcasting and so on um but we observe the data in very very high resolution uh and we're able to actually just throw away that data okay fascinating so um, I see no questions, but if you can think of questions, just put them in the chat and Wendy can answer um, in the chat. Um, now we will take a five minute break and then afterwards we will do our games uh, followed by a second talk.
Okay, the um, gong has chimed just in my ears, which means uh, we continue. Um, and tonight I am going to be presenting the quiz. So, uh, and I, I just want to note that tonight is my first night uh, presenting the quiz. So I hope everything <laughs> runs smoothly um, and I hope you have fun. Uh, so to start off, uh, you can go to uh, menti.com uh, using either uh, your computer that you're on or another device, uh, either a, a tablet or a phone or a, a laptop. Uh, simply go to menti.com uh, and put in this number here, uh, 59830698. Uh, and then you will be able to join. Okay, uh, when it does ask you for a name, uh, we have no way to split. We, we often split uh, astronomers from, from non-astronomers because sometimes the astronomers have an advantage. Um, sometimes they don't and the non-astronomers win. Um, but if you are an astronomer, astrophysicist or radio astronomer even, um, add an underscore A at the end of your name just so that we can identify who you are. Uh, and one thing to note is that faster answers gain you more points. So if you're not sure, just answer quickly. Um, don't spend too long thinking about it. Uh, this is also all meant to be for, for fun. Okay, so it should have asked for your, your names. Um, wait, I think maybe it actually only asks after this first slide. Uh, so the quiz is in two parts tonight. The first is a few questions, general trivia questions um, about radio astronomy in general. Uh, and then the last few questions are about uh, radio telescopes. Uh, and do you know what they look like? So yes, uh, this is what I remembered. It only asks you to put your name in uh, at this point. So I can see some of you are joining. Okay. I'll just give it a moment more. Okay, so if you're ready, the first question, just a reminder, answer quickly. Um, so this radio image was made by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, first published a week ago. So what does it show? Uh, the formation of a binary star, formation of a planet around a star, or the formation of a moon around an exoplanet. You also have a, a maximum of about 15 to 20 seconds to answer, so I will just wait for the timer to run down. And some of you might have remembered the, the first um, news item, or the second news item. This is actually the image published just a week ago uh, showing the formation of a moon around an exoplanet. I mean, it's only recently that astronomers were able to image exoplanets, let alone moons forming around them. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and again, using the power of the high resolution of radio telescopes. So we'll have a leaderboard after each um, to each question uh, so you can see how everybody did and how they stack up. So question number two. Oh, this. My apologies, this is not. Ah, yes. Elmer was very important for the creation of the black hole image of M87 that I showed before. Um, what would the image have looked like without Elmer? So you have a choice of A, B, or C. Um, so these images are made from a collection of telescopes all around the world. Um, and some of them are a bit more important than others.
Okay. Yep. Num what well, letter A was the correct answer. Uh, and this just shows um, actually in the data processing that the scientists made the images with and without various telescopes. Uh, and you can see without ELMA, you really don't get this very nice um, structured uh, ring. You get lots of weird artifacts and less resolution in the actual image. So back to our leaderboard. A little bit of shuffling around there, I think. Question three. Okay, there are radio telescopes all over the world. Um, where can you not find one? On Antarctica, around the Earth orbiting, uh, or on the moon? Uh, a lot of people answered on the moon. Uh, the answer is actually orbiting the Earth. Um, while the leaderboard plays, um, there's actually, in 2019, uh, there was a radio telescope or part of a radio telescope in all of these places. Um, but in the beginning of 2019, um, the Chinese launched the Chang'e for a mission that went to the moon and it contains carries a, a radio telescope uh, as part of the mission. Um, but also in 2019, uh, the Radio Astron uh, Space Radio Telescope um, stopped uh, operating after about seven years. Um, and it's contributed over the seven years uh, a number of very detailed high resolution studies of these, these black holes. So there's currently not a radio telescope orbiting the Earth. Question number four. Uh, some of you may have recalled in the news in the last year, the Arecibo telescope collapsed. Um, what other telescope collapsed in 1988? Uh, is it Westerbork uh, or Lovell Telescope in England or the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia? <laughs> For any uh, British people out there, um, the Lovell Telescope is still standing. Um, it was the, there should have been an image with that one. Um, it was the 300 foot, um, and I'm afraid I don't actually know what that is in meters, um, telescope in Greenbank that, that collapsed. It was simply built too big. Question number five. Uh, this is an image of the cosmic microwave background, um, and if you squint at it, you can see the initials of which famous astronomer? Vera Rubin, Stephen Hawking, or Christian Huygens? Yes, it is an SH. Um, arguably for Stephen Hawking. Um, but with enough random data, uh, one can actually find all sorts of improbable patterns um, in the, the data. So a few changes on our leaderboard. Oh, the number one has changed since I last looked. Uh, question number six. Oops, I think I accidentally went too far. Yes, so LOFAR observes at really low uh, radio frequencies, um, but which is the brightest object in the LOFAR sky? The Sun, the Moon, Jupiter, or Saturn? Okay, what do we have? Uh, equal votes for the Sun and Jupiter. Uh, the correct answer is Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field um, and the Galilean moon Io uh, orbits very close in and is extremely uh, volcanic. 
um, and partly due to its interaction between uh, well between IO and the, the magnetic field it produces this very bright uh, radio emission so it's one of those annoying objects in the sky for us at low far so what has that done to our leaderboard Team Sloth coming up there, not so slow. Question number seven. Oh, I actually need to press the button. No, I'll press the button too quickly. Okay, how many dishes and antennas will the square kilometer, square kilometer array have? Uh, you have a number of options, 50 dishes, 40,000 antennas. 75 dishes, 20, 200,000 antennas, or 200 dishes and 130,000 antennas. Okay, most popular answer was 200 dishes and 130,000 antennas. That turns out to be right. So it'll have a lot of dishes. Nope, a bit of a change there. Question number eight. Uh, which of the following has not yet damaged a low fast station? Is it spiders, humans, birds, cows, moles, or ants? Lots of votes for spiders. Um, turns out that cows, to, to my knowledge, at least no cow has yet harmed a LOFA antenna or station. Uh, there have been plenty of spiders in the electronics, uh, humans vandalizing things, uh, and so on. Also birds landing on the, the antennas. Ah, uh -huh, somebody got it right. Moving up there. Yep, keep going fast, you can still uh, get ahead. Okay, the last few questions uh, are about which one, well, is it a radio telescope or not? Um, one caveat, radio telescope is used for observ observing the sky. Um, so, the first one. You should see this image, is it a radio telescope? Uh, at least you have 15 seconds to answer. Nope, it is not. <laughs> well, then it is a, a washing line. Um, that any collection of wires could be a an antenna. Maybe not a very good one. Okay, who is fast? Next question. Is this a radio telescope? Sadly, it is not. Arguably, it could be, but it is a collection of uh, ham radio or amateur radio uh, antennas. So it is antennas that operate at the radio, but not for observing the sky. Okay, next question. Is this a radio telescope? Uh, 
Yes, it is. This is the Rattan 600 radio telescope uh, in Russia. Uh, and each of those, that ring, is essentially a mirror at radio wavelengths um, that transmit to a central receiver, reflect to a central receiver. So radio telescopes don't have to be whole. A little change in the leaderboard. Okay, next question. I think there's two more to go. Uh, is this a radio telescope? No, well done everybody. Um, it is a collection of radio uh, antennas. Uh, it was used in the Cold War era um, for spying on enemy um, transmissions. Okay. Oh, no, second to last question. Oh, um, I don't know if you are, oh, there's the image. Um, is this a radio telescope? Uh, yes, it is. It is part of the Nancy Decometric uh, Radio Telescope. I think it's one of the reflectors. And the final question. Once again, is this a radio telescope? Yeah. Sorry, option three, um, don't answer option three, you'll get it wrong. Uh, yes, it is. This is maybe a slightly tricky one because it's the remains of a radio telescope. This was the interplanetary scintillation array, which uh, Jocelyn Balbell now used to discover um, the first pulsars. Um, so uh, what does the leaderboard look like? Do the final scores change anything? Uh, a small change. The winner is Team Sloth. Uh, congratulations. Uh, and congratulations also to our astronomer winner. winner. I'm not sure if I can bring that up again. Yes, Canadian Air is our uh, astronomer winner winner um so if you did win the game uh, if you could let us know uh send us an email uh, and then we'll be in touch uh, to try and send you a small uh prize so thank you all uh, i hope you had fun playing the playing the game uh, and i'll pass you back on to Lemim. thank you wendy I will just quickly share my screen. Yeah, can you see it? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Wendy. And you say that it was your first time presenting the games, but that was perfect. And I'm sure our audience will also agree. And um, now that this really fun game is over, it's time to come back to science. And today our second speaker is Fritz Fein. Uh, he's a graduate student at Leiden Observatory uh, with a passion for coffee and sound design. He did his undergrad from Rijks University at Groningen, where working on making a telescope with three fellow students sparked his interest in radio astronomy. And now he follows in a same route where he works in an international collaboration, working on how to best exploit the low frequency array or the low telescopes to its, uh, its full potential. And today in his talk, he's going to tell us more about the power of this pan-European telescope in chasing Hubble-like um, resolution in really low frequencies. 
Um, so when he's not doing science, he likes to explore the art of bonbons, as you can see in the lower right image, and the art of 3D printing. So in uh, 2019, he printed uh, various tactile planets and asteroids that were part of International Astronomical Union's um, Inspiring Stars exhibition at the Gala van der Sterrenkunde that uh, were also visited by the King of the Netherlands himself, as you can see in the picture. So with that, I leave the screen to Fritz. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Let me find the share screen button. Should be sharing this one. Um, can you see this? Yes. All right, perfect. So thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak here tonight. And uh, thank you for that uh, nice introduction. So yeah, my name is Fritz. I'm a PhD candidate at Leiden Observatory. And tonight I'll be showing you a, a little taste of what LOVAR can do if you use it to its fullest potential, which has been uh, the subject of, the P of my PhD over the past few years. And uh, that means trying to get the highest resolution possible that this instrument can give us. And ideally, we want to get close to, as I call it, Hubble-like resolution, so we can really compete with those nice optical, image that we are, optical images that we are used to from astronomy. So uh, as any presentation have, we have to start with the table of contents. So I'll give a short introduction, then we'll go into this quest for more detail in the radio sky, and then we'll end up at the, in, at the International Lover Telescope, and I'll finish off with some concluding remarks. But before I do that, I have to say thank you to my collaborators, because of course I didn't do this work on my own. I've worked uh, with many people, and this is the culmination of many years of hard work by all those people together. So jumping right into it, where Wendy started with, uh, with zooming out to larger and larger scales, I jump back to the very smallest scales immediately, because the key question for me is, I want high resolution and why do we care? Now this high resolution is actually very common at gigahertz frequency, so what we call in radio astronomy high frequency observations, because it's inherently just easier to do. And I think the most famous example on the planet at the moment is this image from the EHD collaboration where they've imaged the shadow of a black hole. And with inherently easier, I by no means mean to say that making this image on the right was an easy task, but compared to the lower frequencies in the megahertz regime, it is still a little bit easier. Uh, and the reason that it's harder for LOFAR is due to a few technical and physical reasons, which I will get, which I will get into in a minute. So that begs the question, why do we not stay at these gigahertz frequencies where it's so much easier? Now, the first reason is just simply one of right or beauty, you could say, because we just want exquisite views on radio emitting objects and we want that on any wavelength we can imagine. But the second reason is that in order to properly study the evolution of these radio galaxies, these supermassive black holes and other radio emitting objects, over cosmic time, we need to be able to get a quote-unquote normal view of faraway objects. Because if objects on the sky are physically farther away from us, they also tend to be smaller. And that means that our telescopes need to be able to resolve more detail to be able to study the same scales in those faraway objects as we can see in the objects nearby. Now it turns out that low frequency radio emission, so the types of emission that LOFAR is sensitive to, is absolutely crucial for us to understand the evolution of radio galaxies. So the chase of this high resolution imaging is really because we need, as I call it, gigahertz resolution at these megahertz frequencies, because we need to be able to probe these galaxies at the same amount of detail as we can these nearby galaxies and at other frequencies. Now the problems that arise at low frequencies are twofold, and well, you can imagine more problems, but these two will be the, the key problems that LOVAR has to deal with. And the first one is due to the ionosphere. Now I think everyone here will be familiar with the atmosphere and the air that we breathe. It's very useful to us, and if we look up at a nice sunny cloudless day, then you can see this atmosphere scattering all the sunlight and giving this nice blue hue to the sky above our heads. Now, in the upper atmosphere, we have this layer called the ionosphere, and this contains a lot of charged particles, and that does the same scattering to these radio waves. And unfortunately, this effect becomes extremely strong at low radio frequencies, and it makes it particularly annoying for telescopes like LOFAR. 
But as you go to higher and higher frequencies, so gigahertz frequencies and further, then this effect practically disappears. And that is one of the reasons why it's so much easier to do radio astronomy there. Now, to illustrate the effect of this ionosphere, I have a short movie here where we see actual LOFAR data with on the left what we call a calm ionosphere and on the right what we call a wild ionosphere. So it depends on the activity from the sun, for example, how, um, how this ionosphere changes during the night or during the day. And its effect is the same as if you were lying at the bottom of a pool and trying to observe stuff in the sky above your head. If the water in the pool is relatively calm, then you have the situation on the left. You just have calm, slow waves and nothing really changes about the image. But if someone starts splashing around the water and you get huge ripples and waves across your pool, then all of a sudden it becomes harder and harder to see where exactly the objects are on the sky and your view on the sky becomes distorted. And you can see that in this animation as the sources moving around and sometimes even disappearing completely from the image. Now each frame that you see in this movie is 30 seconds in real time and what you need to imagine for what we call a LOFAR observation, so all the images that Wendy showed, for example, we take the average of a couple of hours of data. Now you can imagine if these sources are jumping around this much and you average it all down over a couple of hours, then you completely lose all sense of where your object is and then also your resolution is just garbage because all your emission is smeared across the sky. Now, luckily, our decades of experience with, uh, with LOFAR, well, one decade of experience almost with LOFAR, has taught us a lot about the ionosphere and how to deal with this. So this we can now pretty well calibrate away. So we're no longer affected by this. But then the other problem that we have at low radio frequencies is the resolution. And resolution is a funny thing because it's inherently tied to the frequency and the size of your telescope that you observe with. And in the case of LOFAR, a low frequency means also an inherently poor resolution. So again, this is a very bad situation. So for LOFAR, we have picked the worst of both worlds. We have uh, a major annoyance by the ionosphere, and we also have a major annoyance from the low resolution that is inherent to, uh, to low radio frequencies. And to illustrate the effect of resolution, what we're talking about here, very simply, we see uh, an image of an optical galaxy, this is Messier 101. And on the left, you have this image at low resolution. So either you're using a small telescope or you're observing at low radio frequencies. And on the right, you have that same image as if you were observing it through a big telescope or at high radio frequencies. Now for LOFAR, we want the lowest radio frequencies, but we want the image in as much detail as we can see on the right. Now, because LOFAR is designed to observe at low frequencies, and because we have scientific reasons to observe at those low frequencies, our only option is to build a te bigger telescope. Now the quiz during the break already uh, alluded to my next slides a little bit. So the solution is you build a bigger telescope. And on the photo here, we see the Green Bank Telescope, which was at the time the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world. It had a, a 300 foot dish, which is about 90 meters, I believe. And this thing was still fully steerable, so it could go up, down, left, right, and you could point it at any point in the sky that you wanted to observe. But you can imagine that if you have a 90 meter dish of steel and concrete at the base, it requires a lot of maintenance to keep this thing running. And at some point it just became too much and the entire telescope collapsed. So yes, we can kind of counteract this low resolution by building bigger telescopes, but at some point we just reach a physical limit where, well, gravity takes over and just says no, no further. And to overcome that limit, we don't build physically larger telescopes, but we started building more telescopes. And here we see a, a cartoon illustrating what we call interferometry. And I'm not going to go into detail what this exactly is, but this is the operating principles of the entire LOFAR telescope. And it basically means that we can use two separate smaller telescopes to pretend we have one big telescope. So if we consider this cartoon, we have one telescope on the left and one telescope on the right. They are both fairly small, but effectively, if we send both signals to a computer and do some proper math on them, we have a telescope that is the size as the distance between these two telescopes. So by setting telescopes very far apart, we can make a very big physical telescope without actually building a very big physical telescope. 
Now with Lothar, we've taken this to our advantage very much. And here we see uh, a map of Europe with an overview of the entire International Lofar Telescope. So in blue, we see the countries that are partnered with Lofar, and in orange, we see the locations of all the Lofar stations. Now in the Netherlands, we have uh, what we often refer to, refer to as Lofar or the core of Lofar, which is about 100 kilometers in size. But if you include all the other stations that we have, and you go from Ireland to Poland, all of a sudden we have a telescope the size of a continent. And without blocking out the sun for the entirety of Europe, we now have a telescope that is effectively 2000 kilometers in diameter. And now this solves all of our resolution problems and LOFAR is now actually very good at making high resolution images of, uh, of the low frequency radio sky. And actually the combination of all these things is what makes LOFAR so unique. Because a telescope has, in my opinion, three points of performance that it, uh, that it satisfies. It has a field of view, so the amount of sky that it can see in a single observation. It has a certain resolving power, so the amount of detail that it can see. And it has a certain sensitivity, so basically how faint can we go. Now what makes LOFAR so unique is that it excels at each single one of these points. So it has a very large field of view. And what I mean with that is that if LOFAR makes an observation of the sky, it can see an area equal to 25 times the area of a full moon. So if you go outside and there's a full moon, then you just imagine there's a five by five grid of moons on the sky. And that is roughly the amount of sky that LOFAR will see in one go. Now on that same area of sky, we have such an incredible resolving power that we could detect the Great Pyramid of Giza if we placed it all the way on the moon. So that's the amount of detail that LOFAR can now see if we include the stations over the entire continent. And finally, because we have so many antennas, LOFAR is also extremely sensitive, so we can uh, study really faint objects in the radio sky. And to make another analogy that is the same as if we were able to detect Christmas lights turning on all the way down on Pluto. And this is what makes LOFAR such a powerful radio telescope and, and the biggest low frequency radio telescope in the world, actually. Now, this was a, a bit of a technical introduction of, of what the International LOFAR Telescope is. But the real question is, of course, so what do we see? We've built this thing, we've spent years trying to master it. What, what does it actually now tell us about the sky above our heads? And to explore that, I will start with this very boring picture of an optical galaxy. So this is a source I studied at the beginning of my PhD. And here we see in the background how this galaxy looks like with our own eyes. So this is optical light and we see that it's a blob, not really anything interesting going on. It's red in color, which means it's either an elliptical galaxy probably, or it's far away because more distant objects tend to be redder. Now, if we look at this object with the Dutch LOFAR telescope, then suddenly the picture starts to change we see two giant blobs of emission turning up. So we can already infer that something is going on in this galaxy because we see radio emission that is outside of the range of the optical galaxy. But we still can't exactly determine what is going on because the resolution of this Dutch LOFAR is still a little bit too low to exactly see what is happening here. Now, if we look at the same galaxy with the International LOFAR telescope, then all of a sudden the picture changes into this. And now we can see a lot of structure pop up that we couldn't see before. And now we can identify the supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy, which we refer to as the core. We can see these beautiful radio lobes forming at the edges of the jets that that black hole launches. And we can see the hotspots, which is where the jet actually meets the intergalactic medium. Now this source in particular, for those who are interested, is a very boringly named source 4C4315. And the reason that I studied this is because it's a so-called high redshift radio galaxy. Now I won't go into detail about what that means, but basically the light that this object emitted comes from an era where the universe was only 2.6 billion years old. And now with the International Lobar Telescope, we can study these objects for the first time in this amount of detail. And for example, what this can tell us is if we look at the shape of this radio galaxy, then we already see that the southern lobe is very different in shape from the northern lobe. And for example, that tells us something about the environment that this galaxy resides in and how it interacts with the medium around it. Now, of course, this is only one object. And I mentioned earlier that LOFAR has this gigantic field of view. 
So I dubbed the final frontier of LoFAR to, to the question, can we do this all sky? And this final frontier is also known as my PhD, because this is basically what I've been spending the last three years of my uh, well PhD on, trying to explore if we can do more of the sky in one go than just one object. Now, fortunately for me, the answer turned out to be yes. So uh, I will show you a little bit of what the sky at high resolution looks like. Unfortunately, this image contains so many pixels that I, there's not really any good way to show you this. So I've, I've tried the best I can to make the comparison, but I've yet to find out the, the ultimate way to present this work, so to speak. But here we see uh, a section of the sky as the Dutch array would see it. So we have this uh, already quite high resolution. We see some extended source in the middle and some other slightly extended sources around it but most of them still appear to be point-like in nature. Now, if you point the International Lofar Telescope at it, it transforms into this. Now, a lot of sources seem to disappear. Um, in reality, there are so many pixels in this image and the sources become so small that they just don't show up. But many of the sources that we see here simply turn into much smaller dots, but they do remain. But you can see in the center, for example, the amount of detail that we gain by going to this higher resolution. And to show it with a bit more flair, I, uh, I've made a small collage of just a few random sources that caught my eye when strolling through the field. So what you see in these six images is on the background, again, an optical image. So what our eyes would pick up if, if we were telescopes. Then the orange lines in the background is what we usually call contours. So they show the radio emission as the Dutch LOFAR array would see it. And then the solid blue, yellow, reddish fluffy color on top of that is what the international LOFAR array sees. And you can see the tremendous amount of detail that we gain by, well, basically building a, a continent sized telescope and aiming that at the sky. So closing off with a little bit of future perspective, uh, I hope I've uh, conv convinced you that LOFAR is a very powerful and unique tool for low frequency radio astronomy. Uh, furthermore, this resolution is very essential to us astronomers. Uh, we can study the black hole evolution in new detail. And actually something that I didn't mention is that this high resolution is crucial for us to, to distinguish the activity from this black hole from normal star forming activity in the galaxy, because it turns out if you can't resolve, as we call it, this galaxy in so much detail, then they masquerade as each other. So a black hole can hide itself as star formation or vice versa. Now, people already asked a little bit about uh, the SKA, but uh, fortunately for us, LOFAR will not be beaten anytime soon. We'll be not be building anything on the northern hemisphere that, uh, that competes with LOFAR, and to my knowledge, also not on the southern hemisphere. And we've finally been preparing a little bit of a press release about some various results that have come out uh, this year. So keep an eye out for any news in the coming months. And with that, I leave you at this final slide. Thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Fritz. That was an excellent talk. Um, so let's go to questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat um, or use the raise hand button on Zoom and uh, you can ask Fritz yourself. So we already have a question in the chat. Andrew, would you like to unmute and ask yourself? Or would you like me to ask on your behalf? Okay, I'll take that as I will ask you Fritz on Andrew's behalf. Uh, so the question is, what is the theoretical maximum diameter of a low far type of radio telescope on earth? So the theoretical maximum diameter is, is basically what they've done with the Event Horizon Telescope, and that is the Earth. So if you, if you there, there are some slight limitations, like they have to be able to see the same bit of the sky, but theoretically you can place them at opposite sides of the Earth, and then, then you'd have that as your physical limitation. But of course, uh, for example, with the Radio Astron Satellite, you can push this further and just start launching things into space. And, and separate them even further, but that becomes uh, a monetary and a logistical problem. Because LOFAR, uh, we now have uh, 72 stations, as we call them, and each of these stations contains dozens of antennas. So building a LOFAR-type telescope, that, that's quite expensive if you want to recreate that in space, so to speak. But theoretically, there's, yeah, the limit is the planet that you live on. 
Um, a very uh, related question was asked by Ruslan uh, in the YouTube chat. Uh, he asks, if we could reach an infinite baseline, would there be any drawback of doing so? So you partially answered that, uh, but if you want to go more into that. Details. Yeah, so there, there are actually, um, I mean, money and, and space and guess are, are, are the physical limitation, but there's actually, there are other limitations. So baseline for the people who don't know is, is the distance between two telescopes. And so the maximum baseline is the, the maximum distance between any two telescopes. Uh, there's actually a, a more physical reason why at some point it becomes less uh, in, um, less worth in doing so. And that is because at some point you start to resolve everything. So everything becomes fluffy and very detailed. And that actually poses a problem for what we call calibrating the telescope, because we have to do certain things to the signals that come in. And if something is not compact enough, then we can't do that anymore. And actually, we are sort of starting to approach that limit with LOFAR currently. So we have to be very careful in building even larger telescopes, because there are just not enough bright and compact sources on the sky anymore to be able to do this. Okay. So are there are there plans to add more telescopes in the outside of Europe? Yes, there are uh, there are plans in doing that. I uh, I'm probably allowed to say that. And there, there are people lobbying and putting uh, a couple of stations in North Africa, for example, to expand uh, that way a little bit. Because what you notice, well, it's a little bit more technical, but what you notice is that Lover is a little bit more elongated. So it, it has, uh, maybe I can go back. Yeah, so what you see, it's it's slightly longer east west than it is north south, and it will benefit us if you add a couple more stations north south, so that it's more more of a circular mirror, so to say. And personally, I would like uh, one or two more stations around the Belgian border or something just to help fill it in. But if you were to add um, stations in, for example, North America, would you need more than one, um, or would one already help? Over on the other so side. So for for North Africa, yes. Um, North America, it's technically possible, but that's so. So indeed, it, it doesn't help if we have one single super long baseline because LOFAR is is based on imaging. So and to do imaging, you need many uh, baselines, as we call them. So each of these dots in the image that you see here is connected to all of the other dots in the image. So you build up a very dense network that we can exploit for information about the sky. And so if you now have something very far away, then suddenly you only have one line, so we can't really use it. Okay, great. Um, there's a question from Micah. So he says, uh, you mentioned ionosphere as a challenge. Uh, how about interference from other megahertz, megahertz sources, such as FM radio, mobile networks, etc.? What frequencies are the most useful to astronomy in this range? And what are the largest potential sources of interference around those frequencies? Ooh, um, yeah, so I think uh, Wendy uh, already explained a little bit about this. So the FM band is uh, that, that we avoid for, for uh, obvious reasons. So low bar, it goes from like 10 to 80 in the lowest. And then there's this gap from 80 to 120 that is occupied by the FM band and then LOFAR starts at like 120 megahertz again because otherwise we're completely swamped out by, I don't know, Guns N' Roses, ACDC, anything that we are not interested in when we're studying galaxies. Um, so interference is something that we, we indeed have, uh, have as a problem and that, as Wendy said, it's digital radio broadcasts and all that sorts of things, uh, very low frequency communication. But as Wendy also says, we record the data at high enough frequency resolution. So we go to really thin slices of frequency that we can exactly pinpoint where that is. And then we just cut it out and ignore it. And in the case of the International LOFAR Station, it actually helps in the sense that if someone turns on the radio in Ireland, then that does not correlate with someone in Poland. So we can exploit the fact that the station in Poland will not detect the radio in Ireland to neglect the radio in Ireland, so to speak. Interesting. Uh, a question from our team. Uh, how does the international LOFAR compare to the EHC collaboration? Are they expected to be complimentary? Um, is the megahertz yeah, versus gigahertz? Could say. So it's, it's, first of all, completely different frequency regime because the EHT operates at uh, 230 gigahertz. 
and we operate at uh, well the lower band stops at 240 megahertz so um, it's at least a factor of thousand different in frequency so that also means we can't really reach such extreme resolutions and also another difference that i would say is that the eht is more of an it's more of a concept like it's an ad hoc thing like we gather all the random telescopes around the world and make them work together you have alma you have i don't know other radio telescopes and you make them work together whereas lofar is actually one physical telescope it's not suddenly that tomorrow poland says like oh uh, sorry we're doing something else we can't help out lofar is is really one single entity whereas the eht is different telescopes combined that you need to combine all these agendas and the weathers and stuff across the world to make an observation so i'd say yeah they're complementary because they're they're vastly different regimes that you're probing interesting i didn't know that about um the ilt actually um final question for me uh have you observed m87 uh, is it possible to observe from the northern sky um, um and how yeah, would it think, look like i think it's in the archive um i know that there is someone in the collaboration that is very eager to uh, to observe that source because it's his favorite thing uh, wendy showed it in the beginning the m87 i think oh, okay uh, yeah so it has been observed Sorry. but i don't Sorry. Sorry, just uh, interrupting there. Uh, that that image I showed right in the beginning, the the last scale was a low fi image of M eighty seven or Virgo eight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you see these big so jets, I, yeah. Yeah. So actually, what Wendy showed, you see these huge lobes, and those will actually disappear because the resolution is so high that you can't see that anymore. But I I don't have an image handy because I I don't think I'm allowed to touch that data. <laughs> but uh, but I'm sure it has been observed. Great. Thank you so much, Fritz, for your fantastic talk. I will pass the mic to back to Lamim, who can give us a final concluding remarks. Thank you. I'll just quickly share the final slides. So yes, uh, that were like two really fantastic talks and super interesting. I hope uh, all of our audience really enjoyed that. Um, and if you'd like to attend such uh, more events, uh, you can uh, you can check out more Astronomy on Tap online events in the website that's shown here. And uh, our next event will be at the end of August on 30th, and uh, we will post more details in our social media channels. And also we'll, we'll send out emails uh, through our email list. So if you, you want to attend, uh, yeah, please uh, stay tuned. Um, with that, um, yeah. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank our speakers once again for their excellent talks. And this token of our thanks, uh, we'll, we promise that they will find their way, way to you, even though not in person right now. Um, and uh, last but not the least, uh, a big shout out to our entire team. Of course, this whole event would not be uh, possible without all of our uh, um, your collective efforts. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, this is, uh, I suppose, the end of our today's event. So thank you all for joining in, and I hope you all have a nice rest of the evenings, and we hope to see you next month as well.